guys have been digging into the Word of God? Because if you haven't, that's no good. Uh, we need the Word of God each and every day. And so uh, I hope that uh, you guys are able to spend some time going into the Word and digging into the Word, spending that with God. And so for today's sermon, I want that to impact your head, your heart, and your hands. And so uh, in order for life transformation to happen, we actually have to apply the Word of God. And so... A bibliophobia, this is the fear of biblical truth upsetting your delusion. Okay? And so, sometimes we hear things from the Bible, and you're like, ah, no, not really. Well, guess what? Okay? You can't have that fear. Whatever the Bible is telling you to do, you ought to do it. And this is today's comic for today. It says, don't forget wrapping paper. Don't forget tree lights. Don't forget candy. But more importantly, don't forget Jesus for this season. And so today we are going to continue with our sermon series for December. And so this is part two of part four. Um, it is titled Peace on Earth. This entire month we're going to focus on this topic of what does it mean to have peace during the Christmas season. And so today's sermon title, it is titled do not be afraid, but have peace. And so, this is the question that I ask myself. What do I do when I don't know what to do? I think all of us have been in situations in life. We've had things happen in our life. And you're like, whoa, I was not expecting that. I don't know what to do. And you feel like you're stuck between a rock and a hard place, not knowing what decision to do. And so maybe I'm not the only one that has experienced that. Maybe perhaps you have also asked yourself, what do I do now when I just don't know what to do? And so God's simple message to us today, trust in God's message and you will experience his peace. So we have to be able to trust in God's message. And whatever that message is, if it comes from Him, we will experience His peace. Okay? So, to get us started here today, we're going to watch a video. This video explains to us why is it that we dream. So, I moved over to my new house. And because we live all a little bit in the boonies now, I've been having some technology, uh, lack of technology out of the boonies. And so you guys are going to have to be patient with me. I have the hot spots on these things. Because uh, when you're living on the boonies, I can't really download too easily. So. Now, dreams are sequences of images, ideas, emotions, and sensations. Hey there. Welcome to Light Up. So dreams are a part of our everyday lives. But have you ever wondered why we dream? Well, you're about to find out. Dreams are sequences of images, ideas, emotions, and sensations that occur in the mind during sleep, mainly during the REM or rapid eye movement stage. REM seems to be linked to a cluster of memories. This may last five to 20 minutes, three to five times a night, and sometimes even up to seven. On average, in eight hours of sleep, two of them are spent dreaming. Dreams have been viewed as a connection to the unconscious. They range from normal and fun to overly severe and bizarre. Dreams are generally outside the control of the dreamer, with the exception of lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming is being aware that you are dreaming. You can have control over the role in the dream or be able to change the imagery and experiences in the environment. Pretty cool, right? There is an increased amount of activity in the parental lobes, making lucid dreaming a conscious process. Some researchers suggest that dreams serve no real purpose, while others believe that dreaming is essential to mental, emotional, and physical well-being. Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytic theory of dreams suggested that dreams were a representation of unconscious desires, thoughts, and motivation. And then we have the activation synthesis model of dreaming. Circuits in the brain become activated during REM sleep, which causes areas in the brain involved in emotions, sensations, and memories to become active. The brain synthesizes and interprets the activity and attempts to find meaning in these signals. All the dreams in your head are just your brain trying to stitch some memories together. So, what is the best dream that you've ever had? Let us know in the comment section below and I'll be down there to respond. Or tell us, what should we talk about next? Don't forget. Okay, uh, so 
I'm going to ask you this question. Who has good memories of their dreams? Anyone? <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so, like, it seems to go like half the church. I'm the opposite. Um, I can't remember a single dream that I've had. <laughs> I did. Yeah, so I ain't complaining about that because, you know, sometimes you have bad dreams and those are the ones that you don't remember. But, yeah, like, uh, my wife, Mela, she's able to have those dreams, wake up and explain those dreams to me. And, like, she remembers it so clearly. And it's like, wow. Like, I think I dreamed, but I have no idea what I dreamed about. Yeah, so everybody is a little bit different, okay? So, uh, today we'll be focusing on Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 21, and here it says, This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. Okay, so today in America, a lot of times when people get engaged, this oftentimes means a guy getting on his knees, and pretty much asking for the lady for her hand in marriage. Hopefully she will say yes. And so in response to that, he is going to give her a ring. So today in America, this is how most engagements kind of happen in this society. But then, okay, back then during Bible times, engagements were much more different. It wasn't like how it is today. So back then, during the Bible times, engagements were actually done by arranged marriages. So what this meant was that parents pretty much arranged the marriages. And oftentimes, this is done with little consultation from the couple that's going to be married. And the groom's family agreed to pay a dowry or a bright price. Uh, this description of what I've just said that actually matches very traditionally with the Hmong culture. And so just know that this tends to be more of an Asian type of a tradition in how individuals end up getting married. And so once this agreement was made, they were considered married, even though they hadn't done the actual wedding ceremony. So after the engagement process, whereby the parents pretty much have prearranged uh, these two individuals to be married in the Jewish culture by tradition they were considered technically married although they had not done the actual wedding ceremony the time in between was sort of a testing of fidelity fidelity meaning how faithful they are going to be with each other with the couple living pretty much um, still having little and no contact, they were still separated with each other. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. So this is Mary's perspective, okay? Mary's perspective is that Mary knew she had not had any sexual relations with anyone. So for her to hear that she was going to be pregnant, she was a little confused. So obviously she knew that she was engaged. Obviously she knew that in the future she wanted to have this child that belonged to her and Joseph. But she knew they had not been intimate in that way at all. So for her to get this message, by the way, you're going to be pregnant. She's thinking, that's a little confusing. We talked about that last week. But here's Joseph's perspective on this. Joseph knew he had, okay, not had any sexual relations with Mary. So for him to find out that she was pregnant was a big disappointment. He didn't want to publicly disgrace her so he wanted to end their engagement privately and quietly. So they, did, they didn't live together, but probably in public, he was able to still see her. And little by little, he noticed that she started to have a little bump. And it's kind of interesting, Caucasians call that a little 
one in the oven. A little bun in the oven, okay? I always find that interesting, okay? So Joseph's checking out his wife, and then he's like, you're looking, I mean, like, unless you've been going to Chinese buffets, which they didn't have back then, you look like you're getting a little pregnant, and we have never been intimately together before. And so, like, that was really disappointing uh, for him to see that she must have had a relationship with someone else, and that's the reason why she is pregnant. And so, this shows a lot about Joseph's character. He is a person that has mercy. He is a person that has compassion. He is a person that's not revengeful. I mean, Joseph could have taken her out to the streets and publicly disgraced her in front of all these people saying, hey, I want to be honest with you guys, we have not slept together. And my wife, the person that I'm engaged with, she is pregnant. There is no way I want anything to do with this lady for the rest of my life. According to Jewish custom and tradition, he could have done that. But Joseph was a better person. He did not want to disgrace her in this manner. I think that speaks a lot about the character, the humility, the grace, the mercy that was filled in Joseph. I want to share a story with you guys here. Um, if that doesn't look familiar, that, that guy, you know, that's actually me. Okay? All right. So that's me. So this was back in 2005. This is in Iraq. So my good friend, Wally, um, so he's the Iraqi interpreter. And so when we got into Iraq, uh, I was able to learn a little bit of Arabic, but we needed somebody that could uh, translate full Arabic into English. And by the way, it was very dangerous to be an Iraqi interpreter because the Iraqi interpreters, they were seen as working for the United States. And if the insurgents, if they find out that you're working for the US, you're gonna get killed and, and oftentimes uh, that's what happened. We went through a lot of interpreters because they would come to work where we are based at and then they would walk home or whatever like that and the insurgents would kill them, okay? So anyways, uh, my, my good friend Waleed here, I got to know him. He was an interpreter. And so one day Waleed's like, hey, hey Yang, uh, I'm going to go back home to my city. And when I go back, uh, I'm going to go to the store. Do you want something? And I said, yeah, if you can get me. You know, us, us Americans, sometimes we're kind of a little ignorant, and so I'm like, hey, can you give me a man dress? So he's like, yeah, I'll get you a man dress. So three days later, he came back from his vacation, and uh, he came back with a man dress. And, and so I, I share this story with you guys because I am trying to understand the Iraqi culture. I am trying to understand their tradition. And so there would be many nights that uh, me and the Iraqis, it would just be me and the Iraqis, and sometimes we're like, hey, gang, aren't you a little scared that the Iraqis might do something to you? I'm like, you know what, I just trust that they see me, that I'm a friend, and that they're not going to hurt me or kill me. They could have easily done that because they lived with us. And so sometimes I would go and hang out in their room, and we would just talk about the Iraqi culture. And so then one day we were talking about marriage. And so I asked Wali, because uh, I, I knew I was able to find out a little bit more about the Iraqi culture. And I said, hey Wali, so someday if you have a daughter, okay, and if your daughter ends up losing her virginity before she ends up getting married, what happens in the Iraqi culture? And so then, Walid says, in the Iraqi culture, so this is kind of related to, to, to Mary, okay? If she was to lose her virginity before she got married, in the Iraqi culture, then it was up to the father to do something about that. And oftentimes, if that happened, it meant death for the daughter. 
So I said, well, Lee, if that's kind of like the Iraqi culture, like, what would you do? He goes, I would kill her. And I'm like, you're kidding me. Like, if you found out that your daughter was not a virgin before she got married, somehow she had been in uh, an intimate relationship, if you found out about that, you would literally kill your daughter? He goes, yes, that is the culture here in Iraq. I was like, wow, that's, I mean, that's very different, but that's their culture. So, um, you know, I, I understand that part, but it's like, for, for I think for us uh, Americans to think that, like, that would be your daughter that you would also obligated to kill because she had pretty much um, not been clean, okay? All right, so then these couple of Bible verses that, uh, that we find out about Joseph, these are actually rare times that we get to know how Joseph was like. If you've ever thought about this, after this, the Bible, uh, it doesn't tell us much about Joseph. In fact, we don't even know when or how he died. So this little story about Joseph, this is about, I mean, this is pretty much Joseph's one and only time in the Bible that he gets a little spotlight of celebrity status. Besides that, after this, we don't really hear much about Joseph. We don't know when he died. We don't know how he died. And so this little experience, this little story, this is kind of all we really know about Joseph. So as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. So in Luke, we don't know who the angel is. But based on the information that we gather, we believe that this is the same angel that presented um, himself to Mary. And so during this time, when Joseph is sleeping, this is the same angel Gabriel that came to Mary. And so the angel Gabriel, in the dream, said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. So we know that Joseph's thinking about this. Joseph was afraid to take uh, Mary as his wife. Joseph was reluctant to go forward because you know what? Like he wanted to make sure that this woman was going to be faithful. And if she's already unfaithful according to him, why continue on with the marriage? But then the angel said, do not be afraid. So Joseph was afraid to go forward with the, uh, with the marriage. And this was based on what, we, what he was able to see, and what he was able to know. The reality is that he only knew his side of the story, but he didn't know God's story. So his reality was his perception. And so his perception, based on his observation, is she's pregnant, she must be unfaithful. She is not a good wife, okay? The reality is, how Joseph viewed that is also how you and I, how we view our life. Sometimes we are afraid to move forward because we think what we see and is what we know, but what we see, always, you know, it's not always going to be the complete story. We see our story, but we don't see God's story for us. So Joseph only saw a part of the story, but he thought that he saw the entire story. Same thing for us. Sometimes we only get a little snippet. Sometimes we only get to see a little bit of that story. But we judge and we think that we understand the entire story, but we don't. You're only getting a partial story. You need to see what God's big story is for you. So, when you are afraid to move forward, just like Joseph, you need to be hearing from God. And today, we don't really hear from angels anymore. Some do. Like, I, I still truly believe that, that God is still able to send His angels into the world today. Some of them are angelic figures. I've never seen one. 
I know of maybe one or two people that claim that they have seen angels before, okay? Now, the way that I interpret angels is, you know, I, I just think that God works in mighty ways with human beings, and, and sometimes it's not going to be an angelic figure. But I consider some really special people in my life to be my angels, okay? I also believe that God still speaks through dreams. So, like, I'm sure God tries to speak to me through my dreams, but because I have amnesia, okay, after I wake up, I don't remember those. But for some of you that remember your dreams, I do believe that, you know what, God still does try to send some messages via dreams. But we can hear from God every time we go to the Bible and spend time listening to his word. Okay, so God might not be sending you an angel. God might not be sending an angel through your dreams or whatever like that. But every day, we have an opportunity in our life to be hearing from God. And that comes through his word, which is the Bible. We can also be hearing God's messages we can also be hearing God's story for us. This is also through His Word. And what do I mean by that? Through His Word. Well, as I am speaking, the Word of God is speaking through me. And so it's these sermons. This is God speaking to you. Sometimes, when you're listening to a song, those are all songs that have come from God. So some people would say, well, I only listen to the old school hymnals because those came from God. And it's like, you know what? When Amazing Grace was created during that time, people were like, this is a contemporary song. Okay? And today we're like, oh, those are, those are very traditional old hymnals. But at one point or another, a Christian song it had to be a contemporary song, right? But we're hoping that these lyrics have been God-inspired and so that these messages are coming through God. Some, of, some people, they like to read Christian books. Christian books are still able to have God's messages in there. So God still speaks to us today. And sometimes we just need to ask. Sometimes we just need to stop being so busy. And we need to listen to him. God wants to tell us his entire full story. But sometimes we get so busy, especially on holiday season. We're too busy going here. We're too busy shopping here. We're too busy doing things with our hands. We're too busy visiting people that we forget to spend a little time in hearing God's entire story for us. So God has a greater story for you than you can ever imagine. And sometimes you limit yourself based on your fears. And so today, whatever those fears are, be sure to be seeking out direction and guidance from God alone. All of us are in a situation right now where we're trying to figure out, what do I do? And just like Joseph, he was in a fickle, and he needed to figure out what to do. And thank goodness that God loved him so much that God sent the angel to tell him, have no fear, move forward. You need to continue to proceed to make Mary your wife. All of us are in situations today where you're like, I don't really know what to do. And so my encouragement to you is, are you listening to the message from God? You're not going to be praying right now, and boom, pops the angel and say, yup, go ahead and do that. Okay? Too bad life ain't that easy. But I can tell you, if you are staying close to God in His Word, in His message, He's going to tell you the story of what he wants you to do, like how he did that for Joseph. 
Imagine how different history would have been if Joseph would have thought, you know what, I'm going to cancel this marriage. Can you imagine Jesus growing up and not having a father? Can you imagine Jesus growing up and the entire village thinking of how horrible Mary must have been as a mother? People would have completely, completely stayed away from Jesus and Mary thinking, you know what, these are sinful, horrible individuals in our community. They would have been outcasted because of that. But thank goodness, Joseph said, you know what? I'm going to stick through this. This is my wife. And if this is going to be God's son, and if I have been asked to also be the earthly father to this child, I'm not going to give up on this marriage. Imagine how different the cross story would have been if I would have thought, all right, I'm going to cancel the church. It's not working. Okay? Imagine how different the cross would be today if back in 2016, I would have been like, you know what? It's time to cancel this. Every single one of us, we would have never met Think about that. And think about the work that the cross is doing in the community. Wausau would be a different community if the cross would have never existed. That's kind of a scary thought for me to think about sometimes. I mean, imagine all the people that we have helped. Imagine the people that we have been able to get jobs for. If I didn't have Luke and Laura, if I didn't have Say back then, if I didn't have all of you guys, the cross would not exist today. Our community would have been totally different. Imagine how different your story would have been if you would have thought, you know what, I don't need God in my life. No, God is a crutch. God is for the weak. God does not exist. There is no such thing as God. You don't need God in your life. Imagine how different your life today would be if you would have canceled God out of your life a long time ago because of a fear of something. Because of fear of being judged. You mean you go to church? Maybe a fear of ridicule. You read that ancient book? I can't believe you would believe in something that doesn't even exist. If you would have not continued on a long time ago because of these fears that you had, your story would be so much more different today. But thank goodness that we're all here today. Thank goodness that we are not frozen by fear, but instead we allow God's message to give us the strength, the courage to continue to move forward. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So the angel explained to Joseph, All right, Joseph, I know you guys didn't do anything together. Here's how it happened. It wasn't from you, and it's also not Mary's fault. In fact, it's the Holy Spirit that has come into Mary, that has allowed her to conceive the Son of God. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it says, All right then, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. 
So the gospel message of Jesus Christ says this. The Bible tells us that Jesus' name is also Emmanuel, which means that God is with us. And so as precious as baby Jesus was to Mary, and as precious as baby Eve was to Laura, okay? So Jesus was greatly loved by his mother, just as baby Eve was greatly loved by her mother. Mary was so happy over 2,000 years ago that this precious little child of hers was born. But I truly believe that Mary also knew that Jesus was not your ordinary child. Jesus was born with a special mission. And that special mission was this. Jesus knew that he was born to do something special. And so as much as Mary held on to that precious little baby, she also knew that when he became an adult, Mary would also be hanging on to her precious little baby, but now in a different way. And what way was that? It was so that Jesus Christ could die on the cross. Mary had the responsibility to realize that I am the caretaker of God's Son. And this is going to be the Son that is going to save mankind. This is the Gospel story. Jesus was born so that He can die. All of us, we are to die. But in Jesus Christ, we are born to a new life. And that life is in Jesus Christ. So whatever fears that you may have this Christmas, put your faith and your trust in the Lord. There's a lot going on in all of our lives this year. Some of you guys have experienced great tragedy, great loss, great frustrations, great trauma. You don't know what to do. You have been frozen in fear, not knowing what to do. And my encouragement to you today is do what Joseph did. Joseph took the message that he received from God. He embraced that message with faith, and he moved forward. And this is the same message that I'm giving you today. It's coming from God. Whatever that's experiencing in your life today, you need to move forward in the Lord, trusting God. And when you do that, God's got it all taken care of. In Isaiah chapter 41, verse 13, it says, For I hold you by your right hand, I, the Lord your God. And I say to you, don't be afraid. I am here to help you. We have to imagine ourselves in this Bible verse. We have to imagine that we are that precious little child to God. You and I. It don't matter if you're 39 now or you're 65 now. God will always see you as His precious little child. And here the Bible verse says to us that God is holding us by our right hand. I love it. Just coming to church this morning, little Anna is like, Daddy, hold my hand. So what did she do? She stuck out her right hand to me so that I can hold her. And here God says, I am holding you by your right hand. And when God's doing that, He is protecting us. He is keeping us safe. No matter what is going to come, He is going to be there to shelter over you. 
Because he says, I, the Lord, your God, and I say to you, don't be afraid. I am here to help you. Whatever, you, whatever fear that you have this holiday season, give that up on the Lord, our Father. And he says, I've got you taken care of. And when you do that, you will experience God's peace on earth. Great will for men. This is what God wants for you this Christmas season. He wants you to be filled with a spirit of peace, of joy, of happiness. And if you're not experiencing that right now, I am telling you, God doesn't want you to be experiencing anything else besides that. This is a time for us to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And so here at the end, I want to share this really awesome story with you guys. This story is called The Golden Ivory Table Cloth. And the story goes like this. At Christmas time, men and women gather everywhere, gather in their churches to wonder anew at the greatest miracle that the world has ever known. And that greatest miracle is the birth of Jesus Christ to a virgin by the name of Mary. But the story I like best to recall was not a miracle, not exactly. And so what happened to a pastor was a very young man during that time. But his church was very old. Once long ago, it had flourished. Famous men had preached from its pulpit, prayed before its altar. Rich and poor alike had worshipped there and built it beautifully. But now the good old days had been passed on from the section of town where it used to stand. But the pastor and his young wife believed in their run-down church. They felt that with paint, with hammer, and with faith, they could get it in shape again. So together they went to work. But late in December, a severe storm whipped through the river valley, and the worst blow fell upon their little church. A huge chunk of rain-soaked plaster fell out of the inside wall just behind the altar. Sorrowfully, the pastor and his wife swept away the mess, but they couldn't hide the ragged hole that was now in the wall. The pastor looked at it and had to remind himself quickly, Thy will be done. The joyful purpose of the storm that had knocked a hole in the wall of the church was now clear. But his wife wept. Christmas is only but two days away. That afternoon, the dispirited couple attended an auction held for the benefits of a youth group. The auctioneer opened a box and shook out of it its fold of a beautiful gold and ivory lace tablecloth. It was a magnificent item, nearly 15 feet long, but it, too, dated from a long vanished era of a long time ago. Who today had any use for such a thing of a long time ago? There were a few half-hearted bids. Then the pastor seized with what he thought was a great idea. He bid on it for $6.50. He carried the cloth back to the church and he tacked it up on the wall behind the altar. It completely hid the hole and the extraordinary beauty of its shimmering hard work cast a fine holiday glow over the chapel. It was a great triumph. Happily, he went back to preparing for his Christmas sermon. Just before noon on the day of Christmas Eve, as the pastor was opening the church, he noticed a woman standing in the cold 
at the bus stop. The bus won't be here for 40 minutes, he called. And so he invited her into the church to get some warmth. She told him that she had come from the city that morning to be interviewed for a job as a nanny to the children of one of the wealthy families in town, but she had been turned down. She was a war refugee. She had imperfect English. The woman sat down in a pew and rested. After a while, she dropped her head and she prayed. She looked up as the pastor began to adjust the great gold and ivory lace cloth across the hole. She rose suddenly and walked up to the steps of the chapel. She looked at the tablecloth. The pastor smiled and started to tell her about the storm damage, but she didn't seem to listen. She took off a fold of the cloth and rubbed it between her fingers. It is mine, she said. It is my banquet cloth. She lifted up a corner and showed the surprised pastor that there were initials monogrammed on it. My husband had the cloth made especially for me back in Brussels. There could never be another like it. For the next few minutes, the woman and the pastor talked excitedly together. She explained that she was, uh, she was Viennese from Vienna, which is in Austria. That she and her husband had opposed the Nazis and decided to leave the country together. They were advised after that, unfortunately, to go separately. Her husband put her on a train for Switzerland. They planned that he would join her as soon as he could arrange to ship their household goods across the border. She never saw him again after that. Later she heard that he had died in a concentration camp. I have always felt that it was my fault to leave without him, she said. Perhaps these years of wandering have been my punishment for leaving him. The pastor tried to comfort and console her, urged her to take the cloth with her instead, but she refused. Then she went away. As the church began to fill on Christmas Eve, it was clear that the cloth was going to be a great success. It had been skillfully designed and it looked its best by candlelight. After the service, the pastor stood at the doorway. Many people told him that the church looked beautiful with the tablecloth. One gentle-faced middle-aged man. He was the local clock and repair man looked rather confused. It is strange, he said with his soft accent voice. Many years ago, my, my wife, God rest her, and I owned such a cloth that looked just like this in our home in Vienna. My wife put it on the table. He smiled as he recollected this memory. The pastor suddenly became excited. He told the jeweler about the woman who had been in church earlier in the day. The startup jeweler clutched the pastor's arm. Can it be, can it be that my wife is still alive? Together the two got in touch with the rich family who had interviewed the unknown woman for the nanny job and was able to get her information. Then in the pastor's car, they started for the city, and as Christmas Day was born, this man and this wife 
who had been separated through so many sad and yule tides, were reunited after thinking the other had been passed away. To all who heard this story, the joyful purpose of the storm that had knocked a hole in the wall of the church was now very clear. Of course, people said it was a miracle, but I think you will agree it was the season for it. That is. So when you think about this story, sometimes we think, God, how dare you do this? But we're only getting a little bit of the story. And if you and I humble ourselves and trust in God, God is saying, I have a bigger and a better story for you. If only you can just see what I can do for you. And so this Christmas, just know that God is with you. And whatever fears that you have in your life today, we need to give those up to the Lord. Sometimes God allows these things to happen because there's a greater story that he has not finished. Okay? Amen to that. All right, so what are we going to do with the message today? Let's allow the message to impact our life. What is one thing that you are afraid to move forward with this Christmas? Please give this up to the Lord. Please pray about that. So here at the end, this is the reason why our sermon question is, what do I do when I don't know what to do? And it's really simple. What we need to do is we need to trust in God's message, and that message is that God loves you, and you will experience his peace. And this is the reason why today's sermon title is titled, Do Not Be Afraid, But Have Peace. Let us pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you so much for this Christmas story. Lord God, how blessed it was. Lord God, that despite a difficult situation that Joseph was in, as afraid as he was to move forward with his marriage, Lord God, that you loved him so much, and you sent your message to him. And it's for him not to be afraid, but to trust in you. Lord God, we all need to hear of this today. <laughs> How many of us here today, Lord God, we're in a predicament that we don't know what to do. We're afraid to move forward. But Lord God, would you just break our hearts, Lord God, so that we would begin trusting in you. Lord God, so that we're not afraid, because Lord God, that you have a greater story to share for us. So that we're not going to be frozen to our fears, but instead, Lord God, that we will move forward in faith with 